Thank you very much. How, how completely fabulous to be in a house dominated by Republicans. That's okay. Hey, uh, let me tell you this. I just got done with my State of the State last week in a house controlled by Democrats. And so I had that fun then, but this is a much different kind of fun for me. I thank you for giving me the opportunity to come before you today and, uh, and speak about the challenges that we face. Uh, and I come to you from the perspective of a governor of a neighboring regional state who understands both the challenges that you face every day and the opportunities that are presented to you every day. And that those challenges and opportunities are made both more difficult to deal with on the challenge side and less advantageous on the opportunity side when the federal government gets more and more involved in what you were elected to do and to take care of those you were elected to represent every day. And so I bring to this race for president the perspective of a governor for six years in a state which I lovingly call unruly to govern. And the federal government makes it only more difficult to do that and to govern. When we look at some of the biggest problems that we're facing, we face similar problems. I was happy that our administration worked with the folks in the Senate and the House here on some of the bills you were just discussing regarding our opioid addiction problem. In New Jersey, we started on this at my initiative three years ago. Three years ago, I said that we needed to change our criminal justice system. Three years ago, I said we needed to move from an attitude of incarceration to an attitude of treatment. Because too many people were dying, young and middle-aged, who were nothing more than victims of a disease. The conversations we need to be having as representatives of the people, in my opinion, is to talk about this issue openly and honestly so that we can lower the stigma that's attached to this disease. I've spoken many times about my own mother who was addicted to nicotine. She started smoking when she was 16 years old. And back in 1948, no one knew there's anything wrong with smoking. In fact, it was the cool thing to do. And she got addicted. And if you, want, if you doubt for a second it was an addiction, I would love to take you back in time to watch all the efforts that my mother went through over the years to try to quit smoking. She chewed gum, the patches. She even tried hypnosis one time, which was great for us because it kind of mellowed her out a little bit, and we, we enjoyed that. So mom needed to have some of those edges sanded down a little bit at times, but it didn't help the smoking, so she stopped. And at 71 years old, after 55 years of smoking, she was almost inevitably diagnosed with lung cancer. And when that happened, no one said to me that we shouldn't treat her. No one said she's getting what she deserves. She made a choice. So no treatment for her, just let her die. No one said that. Nor was I ashamed to tell anyone that my mom had lung cancer and she had been a smoker. I didn't think it reflected upon me as a son or my father as a husband or most importantly, on my mother as a woman. I wonder if I would have felt the same way if my mother was addicted to heroin. Given the mores and the stigma attached to this disease, you don't talk about it. People do say this is a choice and people are getting what they deserve. We do deny treatment to folks who need it for a disease. It's wrong. And we as a society have to change. And I honestly believe that the only way it's going to change is by saying to those folks, listen, if you're committing violent acts and you're dealing these drugs in our neighborhoods and poisoning our families, there should always be a jail cell available for that person. But for the nonviolent, non-dealing addict who is struggling with a disease, putting them in jail costs the taxpayers much too much for a yield that is much too small. They come back out as addicts and they commit more and more crimes and go back in prison. And we wonder why this cycle continues. It continues because we're ignoring, we're ignoring the real problem. 
And the real problem is this. We need to stop making moral judgments on their choices and start trying to help them restore their lives. See, that means that even if not everyone can be treated successfully, and I know they can't, every person that we treat successfully, every one of them, is returned home to be a better mother or father, a better sister or brother, a better son or daughter, a better husband or wife. We can't calculate the way the economists do what that means for our communities and our state, but we know that rebuilding families makes us a better, more just, stronger society. And so in New Jersey, three years ago, we said no longer any first-time nonviolent, non-dealing offenders will go to prison. They will go to mandatory inpatient treatment. And what's happened since then? In those three years, our crime rate has gone down 20 percent. In those three years, our prison population has gone down 10 percent, allowing me last week at my State of the State address to announce the closing of a state prison. We're not building new prisons in New Jersey. We're closing prisons. And we're taking that prison. <laughs> what are we doing? We're taking that prison, and we are now rehabilitating it, and we're turning it into a full-time drug treatment center where we will be able to take up to 700 inmates who have drug problems in other areas of the criminal justice system and bring them to that prison. It will be a certified drug treatment facility that will allow those folks to come back out with the tools they need to reclaim their lives. That's the kind of thing we should be doing. And we know, we know that every life we save is money that we also save for the taxpayers too because it costs us $49,000 a year in New Jersey to incarcerate someone. It costs us $24,000 a year to give someone a year of full-time inpatient treatment. We can treat two people for every one person we incarcerate. So even if you just care about the numbers, it's a smart thing to do. But it's much more than that. See, because I'm pro-life. And I believe that every life is precious. And we focus For those of us who believe in the pro-life movement, we focus too much of time, I think, on the nine months in the womb. They're important nine months, but they're the easier nine months, too. They've done nothing to disappoint us yet until they get out. Life gets much more complicated after that first nine months. There's not a person in this chamber, I suspect, who has not made a choice or a decision in your personal or professional life that you wouldn't like to reverse. We are just fortunate in this room that that choice didn't involve drugs. Because there but for the grace of God go I. It does not discriminate everybody. There but for the grace of God go I. And we need to bring, I believe, that sensibility every day to the positions you hold, the ones I hold, and the one I aspire to. See, we need a president who will stand behind the presidential seal and deliver this message to the American people. That is the first step in lowering the stigma and opening people's minds and their hearts. You see, because the child in the womb is a precious, precious life, but so is the 16-year-old girl who's addicted to heroin and laying on the floor of the county lockup. Her life is an individual gift from God. So is the 42-year-old lawyer who is addicted to painkillers and can't keep his job or maintain his family, his life is a precious gift from God, too. We need to stop judging in this area as much as we need to start caring and embracing those people and giving them the treatment that they need. It will not work for everyone, but every life we save, every life we save will be an act that we perform in the name not only of the people we represent, but in the name of the God that we worship. And so, there's lots of different things I could talk to you about today. But nothing's more important than saving the lives of our young people, and the older ones too. And there's lots of important issues that you discuss in this chamber, 
and decisions that you make for the people you represent, and I commend you for it. But I suspect that to the families of New Hampshire, nothing will be more important than to start to give them hope. Treatment is hope. I belonged for years to the board of an adolescent inpatient drug treatment facility in New Jersey. And when the priest who ran that facility, a man named Father Joe Hennon, first asked me to be on the board, and I was in my mid-30s, I asked him, Joe, I've got so many things. I'm a practicing lawyer. I'm involved with lots of stuff. Why should I do this? He said, just come up and see the place, and you'll understand. So I went up and I watched what was going on. And he saw the change of my expression while I was watching. And he came up behind me and he put his hands on my shoulders. And he whispered in my ear, he said, see, I told you you'd want to be here. It's a special place. It's where miracles happen on earth. He said, you're watching the saving of a human life. Nothing can be more important. Nothing can be more important because we know as parents that it could be our children. We know as spouses, it could be our husband or wife. We know as siblings, it could be our brother or sister. At any moment, this disease does not discriminate. It gets the educated and the uneducated, the rich and the poor, the highly positioned in society, and those who are looking to climb up the ladder. So I'm really encouraged, as I've spent a lot of time here in the last nine months, to see the evolution of this crisis in your state as I saw it in mine, and to see you as the elected officials of the people reacting and responding to the needs of the people you represent. If you're cynical about democracy, you should just watch this. Democracy is not the greatest form of government because it never makes a mistake. It's the greatest form of government because it is the easiest form of government to correct those mistakes. And perhaps none of us were doing everything we should to deal with this problem, but now we are. And we need to raise our voices and make this a movement across the country that will save lives and provide hope and opportunity for everyone based upon the goodness of their heart, the depth of their work ethic, and the greatness of their ideas, and not be determined by one bad mistake, one bad decision they made at one point in their life that winds up costing them their life. This is a message that cuts across all party lines. Whether you're a Republican or a Democrat in this chamber, you know people in your personal and your professional life who are dealing with this problem. I'm sure many of you have been to the wakes and the funerals that I've been to and watched the loss of life. We never ask when we go to the wake whether the person who lost their life is a Democrat or a Republican. It doesn't matter. They're a fellow New Hampshire citizen. They're a fellow New Jersey citizen. They're a fellow human being. We spent a lot of time in this campaign for president talking about lots of things, and you've got lots of people who are shooting at each other on a daily basis, probably driving you people to distraction on your TV sets and in your mailboxes and everywhere else. But we need to be talking about this. We need to be accomplishing things surrounding this. And here's the only pitch today that I'll make to you about myself. I've done it. We've done it in New Jersey. We are changing the course of history in our state on this issue. This year, past year, 2015, was the first time in four years that we have seen drug overdose deaths decline. This year, in 2015, drug overdose deaths in New Jersey declined because we have put Narcan across the entire state for the last 18 months. We have trained every law enforcement officer on its use, and we have set up recovery coaches in a majority of our counties now that are there in the hospital when someone comes to to help them begin the path to recovery. When I get to the White House, no one will have to tell me how to deal with this issue or, quite frankly, the other issues that will come before me as an executive. We've seen over the last seven years that that type of executive experience is very useful. To sit in that chair on the first day and not spin around and look and say, gee whiz, look, I'm president. 
but to actually sit there and say, this chair feels familiar. It's not the same one I had before, but it's familiar. And I know how the decisions will come in to this office. They will come fast and furious. They will come without a yes or no answer necessarily, and they will come without a key sheet that you can look at to decide what you need to do. It's the gut. We need to elect someone, President of the United States, who has done this before. Someone who can help to lead our country in a new and a different direction. Opioid addiction is just one of those issues we need to address, but it's an important one. Because if we don't save the lives of our children, we put our country at great peril in the future. And so I cannot, on behalf of myself and my wife, Mary Pat, thank you enough for the courtesy and the kindness and the openness and the welcoming attitude that you and all the people of New Hampshire have shown to us over the last nine months. Um, you're not getting rid of us anytime soon. But we'll continue to ask for an open mind and an open heart and consideration for your support because our country needs to move in a new path and together we can make that new path happen for all of us no matter where we live and no matter where we came from. So to the Speaker, the Majority Leader, and all the members of the House who are here, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you for your attention. And thank you for the New Hampshire primary. We appreciate it.